Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the ball. Welcome to the RTGA podcast. Um, Rory O'Neill is my name. Not the one dancing on Sunday nights, even though uh, it's 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 coming into my social media mentions quite a lot, and I've just given up correcting people. But uh, yeah, stepping in for Mikey Stafford today. He's away on midterm, and delighted to have Darren Maloney, RT commentator, who's been busy out and around the grounds over the last couple of weeks. Same with Fitzmaurice and Kieran Whelan. RT pundits and former players, Dublin Kerry and managers, etc. So, lads, look, I'm going to start this week with Congress. It can be a boring enough. Um, it, it could be a boring enough event for at, at, at some some years, and some years it can be quite interesting because there can be big decisions made. But I suppose the big one this weekend is the election of a new GA president. And rather than getting into who we think should win or who might win. I'd just be curious, Eamon, maybe if you'd start the ball rolling here on <clears throat> what is the role of the president? What should it be and what makes a good one? Yeah, a nice easy one to start with. Uh, <laughs> 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 I suppose uh, I suppose, look, there's absolutely the ambassadorial and kind of ceremonial role that is very important to the uh, GA on the ground. In particular, obviously, we see the Duke, they're on an All Ireland final day presenting the cups and things like that. But, um, you know, getting around to all the clubs and uh, doing that work on the ground, I would see, is an important part of their role. But I think every president then probably tries to make a difference in the overall scheme of things. And uh, not just because he's from Kerry, I think Sean Kelly did, did a lot during his term, he did a lot of very positive things. Um, he was involved in opening up Crow Park uh, to the rugby and the soccer, um, you know, wh while while the Lansdowne Road was being redeveloped. Um, he put in place those club championships for um, junior and intermediate teams. Which, which Kerry clubs are dominating, which is a handy yeah, one from Sean's perspective there, wasn't it, Eamon? <laughs> <laughs> Looking at restructuring it now, which is, uh, which is uh, another controversial one. Yeah. And I saw a thing there the other day as well that um, Jerry Grogan, the vice of Crow Park, as we know him, that when he, when he was looking to change up the presentation in Crow Park and to kind of put a different stamp on things, that again, he got a lot of support from Sean Kelly on that and that it's added to the match day experience. So, you know, I think as a president, you if you're looking at the likes, at what the likes of Sean Kelly did, um, that's probably a, a good enough model. I think you probably have to be brave. You have to be a bit of a visionary in that, um, you know, we are a very traditional organisation and any bit of change at all, even that opening up Crow Park that time, you know, the, there was a lot of um, debate and a lot of rancor around that, but uh, he felt it was the right thing to do. So he held his ground and he managed to get it through. So um, probably something along the lines of that. Hmm. Um, Willow, obviously the most recent vintage from a Dublin perspective and the first Dublin president in a long time was John Horn. You know, again, left a pretty large legacy and I don't know is legacy something that a lot of these guys should be chasing but I mean if you look at the introduction of the Talchin Cup and obviously him having to navigate his way through Covid if you were marking him out of 10 we won't but you'd say he had yeah. probably had a good innings that but, but brought something think, slightly different to the role did he? Yeah well I think that everybody at the end of each president's term asked that question oh, what, what was their legacy and I think it comes back to your original question what is the role of the president? And it's somewhere between that ambassadorial role and representing the GA on the ground and a grassroots level. But it also slides into strategic vision. And I don't know the exact structures, but they are, I think, the end of the line in terms of the ultimate decision maker for that period that they're in office. Um, personally, I, I, I think that maybe, I know it's it, it's been tradition, it's been there for a long, long time, but I think the three-year period is too short. Um, I think it's very hard for somebody to go in and, and, and really deliver their full vision. 
um, in a three year period because you know you look ahead to this weekend and already people will be talking about the next president and they bring their own committees and they bring their own structures and they bring in their own people so they do have a significant role to play in the strategic development of the GA and three years is a very short time for anybody to put a footprint you know any kind of CEO going into into other organizations um you know would have a longer type contract to to, to kind of uh, deliver what they what, what what their values or what their vision is and I, I just think it's a very very tight period it rolls over very very quickly and sometimes maybe presidents don't get that opportunity because as Eamon touched on we're a very slow changing organization and it can take you know when it comes to uh, radical changes you, you have to go back to the well maybe a few times you know congress to to to, to bring through significant change so i i think it's 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 a very good question in terms of what is their role it's somewhere balances between ambassadorial and strategic but i, I don't think three years is, is is enough time for anybody to uh carry out significant change just, Dar just yeah Darryl, like i mean you've worked in the media a lot for a long time now and you've seen so many presidents come and go is a strong media presence an important thing for a president or should they work reasonably quietly in the background and it was any kind of standout moments for you we'll say for any individual president that you thought mm, that guy really nailed it uh, well I and think it's usually a guy thing. by the way <laughs> yeah no exactly uh the person um like i suppose rory when you you know I think in this day and age, a strong media presence is hugely important because that's the way, you know, that that uh, somebody like Larry McCarthy communicates with us, um, and and you know, you need that, and it's the era of the soundbite, um, mm. which you know sometimes isn't very flattering, but you know that we we consume information in kind of short bursts, um, and I think it is very important for that person to be a good media performer as the as the figurehead of the organisation, as somebody who. You know, communicates to the the membership on a regular basis. Um, I suppose uh, to pick up Eamon's point, like I suppose Sean Kelly would be the the, you know, the um the ideal sort of template. Um, and I know what you know he dealt with a hugely historic issue, and it was very divisive, as Eamon pointed out. I kind of not quite forgotten about that those issues, but you know they were there and they were very. Uh, divisive at the time. I'm trying to think back to the early 90s. W would I be right in saying Peter Quinn was, was mm. involved in the redevelopment of Croke Park and getting that whole yep. project? I remember at the time I was in college, so this is like 1991, and you know, doing a, an interview with Peter and a few GA officials for a project I was doing. So this was, you know, massively ambitious. Um, and you know, they, they got it over the line and, and built one of the, the finest stadiums in the world. So, mm. you know, look, they are they're they're kind of you know massive moments in the history of the association the Talton Cup was you know I suppose uh, like for 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 the incoming president um you know do you go and select the biggest issue of the day and say right let's go and fix this um is it like as Jarlath Burns has been talking about is it the expenses issue the payments and making that uh, you know doing that in a more structured way or is it player welfare is it what we're going through at the moment with the colleges competitions the um, you know the provincial competitions is that the most important thing to, to tackle because they ha we, we have the you know the calendar year and the the new timing of the championship you know and that's that's going to be a, a legacy going forward but I think look it's only natural when somebody uh, I take absolutely take Kieran's point about the longer period of time but when somebody finishes their role um, you know people will look back even I know it's in politics but you know people talking yesterday about Nicola Sturgeon the Scottish First Minister what's her legacy um, you know it's it's we are going to do that with Larry McCarthy and we will do that with the next president in well what is it four years time you know so um, that that's it's only natural and again that feeds into the media world um, and everybody wants to review and look ahead and all that stuff so we're going to do that naturally. The, the, picking up on what Dara just said Eamon it's a very thorny issue, the area around payments to managers. And Charlotte has been brave. And it's not the first time Charlotte Burns, to be fair to him, has been brave in coming out and taking on difficult subject matter, let's call it. But if we go back to Park Duffy, who did try and take this particular, take this problem, if you want to call it that, like when they were looking for the payments under the table, the famous line was he couldn't even find the table. So, <laughs> I mean... I I I I know it's 
a very it's a it's a, a much vaunted and very highfalutin ideal to try and tackle this in a practical sense though is it really feasible i mean how do you do it yeah <clears throat> um i might be running for office myself if i the answer to that <laughs> <laughs> um, look it, it is an absolute it's the wild west it's a complete minefield mm. there's no point saying otherwise if if charlotte burns ends up in a position um that he ends up as the as the new president and it's something that he kind of puts as this thing that he's going to tackle to go back to Kiran's point it will take him the three years and it will involve it'll involve a grown-up conversation and it'll involve huge honesty um right across the board from every level of the GA from the smallest club to to the biggest county teams so <clears throat> Is that going to happen? I, I'm not convinced it will. Um, like, the, the whole question is, is amateurism is central to the ethos of the GEA. So, like, if that's your starting point that you're discussing, uh, you know, the values and the central identity of the GEA, it's it's a huge issue. And, and you go from there then. And like you said um, about the table, like, it's, it's so hard to police it, if that's what um, centrally the GA want to do. Um, like this year, we'd say there was a two or three of the Division One football league teams found it very hard to get a manager, and it mm. took them a while to get to to, to get man managements in place because of the nature of the job now and demands of of the job, and it takes up so much time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, if you are going to regularize it, um, are the players going to be looking for their slice of the cake then? What about officers? What about officers up and down the country? You know, like people working in a voluntary role, putting in 20, 30 hours a week, filling out farms, you know? 100%. The officers, the, the groundsmen, you know, the, like, do you kind of separate the inter-county game from the club game? The GA has always been very slow to do that from the point of view that what's good for the inter-county game is good for the club game and vice versa. And I think that was part of the decision-making around the, the Kilmacud, um, the Glen controversy. So, yeah. It, it, it was, is Darla lads though not touching on, you know, he mentions his comments about, you know, let's not be hypocritical about this. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I think he, he was kind of touching on something. Like, we can talk about the what about you, you know, the officers and everybody else in the amateur ethos. But the dogs in the street know what's going on yeah. in terms of. So, you know, it, it, I think it's a very brave conversation to start having. It's It really is opening up Pandora's box because it does lead to, you know, well, if it is structured and it is formalised, and we all recognize that, that, you know, the time that needs to be invested to manage a senior team or a senior under county team is massive. But if you do go down that route of putting some form of structure around that and recognizing in order to keep maybe people involved or keep good people involved, you are, that's, you know, Rory, you've touched on it. You're into the, what about the chairman, the well, the GP, you surely the chief, like if you go down players, that road. But the thing about it is, the players know the managers that this is this this is going on in the environment. They know that as it is. So, like that's the other factor. You know what I mean? But it will lead to the whole question of the amateur ethos. Like it really has a knock on. It has a massive knock on effect if we if 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 they go down this route. And I think it was a kind of case where Parik Duffy kind of just. When he when he when he dug deep, or dug, he, he he put the shovel into the ground and realized it was a big hole. Oh, I think I think, I think it was a big hole. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 you should like you'd have a you'd have, you'd have the GPA. I'm sure would be watching something like this with a very very curious eye, and the the, the, the nature of the water boundary. I I look. I you'd have to give him credit for trying to take on such a subject matter, but. <laughs> uh, here's another another sort of aspect to it and, and and something that we accept and you know like uh, my word what a, what a complicated issue this mm. is to to perhaps start your presidency on and all the, the the various layers to it and the complications with it the revenue um aspects mm. of it but like you know listen in in it let's okay and we're always talking about inter-county setups um for for you know on on the men's side on the ladies side but 
you know, we 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 pay the physios because we have to have, you know, there's two physios that train, maybe more. You know, we pay professionals. We pay the doctors. We pay the stats people. We pay the performance coaches. Um, you know, these massive, vast management teams. And I know there's been a lot of debate over that over the last few weeks when the numbers came out with what, you know, all the, the counties spent on their teams across all levels. Um, you know, but we like it, it just makes it more complicated that, you know, if you've got, if you're in an inter-county setup, um, you're a manager, you're not getting paid, you're getting your expenses, or maybe you are getting paid and you're, you know, the players are getting their expenses. Although that was an issue that I read in RMA over the last few days, they were talking mm. about players saying, we didn't guess, but we're, we're students, etc., and the cost of petrol and diesel and all that stuff. But, you know, we do pay professionals in inter-county setups and in some, in many club setups as well, because if you, you know, a physio has, has gone to college for many years to study and, you know, if they're, if they're engaged in a professional sense, they have to be paid and that goes through the books and all that sort of thing. So it, it's a massively complex issue. Um, and, you know, it, it might take two presidential terms to sort that or maybe even more. Well, we certainly won't sort it out here. <laughs> we'll we leave, leave that one to Charlotte. Um, let's get on to the games at the weekend. Looking forward to a lot of really good football, actually. I can't wait. Like, do one, do, for, first question I'd like to ask Eamon before we get into taking each game on an individual basis is the break week. How would you manage the break week as a manager? Like, do you um, go heavy for the first week in terms of a training workload and then ease off the second week? Or what way would you set the team up when you have that little week off where hurling slots in? I, I would say it's probably a bit different this year, Rory, because of the, the fact that the league is a bit more condensed. I think in previous times, um, you absolutely would have done a bit of work. D depending on the first couple of results, um, if the first couple of results had gone well, you might take a bit of downtime this week and, you know, start to build it up again come the weekend. If the results had gone against you, you might feel that there's a need to get a bit of football in on the pitch because of not getting the quality sessions because you're in the middle of the two games. So it depends, but I feel that the fact that they've only one week off, they have a three-week block again, um, there might have been a bit of recuperation going on this week. I think the... The weekend would have been important, though, the weekend session, because you could get in a daylight session with the full squad. Fellas that had been playing a few games would be recharged by the following weekend, and lads that hadn't got as much game time maybe in the first two games would get a chance to shine in a, you know, an AVB game or whatever you want to call it. So um, I think slightly different this year, because like I said, with the three games, I think there would have been a bit of recharging the batteries this week. I don't think... Too many of the teams that have been looking at it as as a work block, really, to be honest. And would like is it a case the teams are just going to train? Just like I suppose Kevin McStay mentioned before, Wheelo, about how you're going to have to split the season up into three different blocks where you have your league, you have your provincial championship and you have your Sam Maguire. And is it about tailoring your approach to each of those on an individual basis in terms of what you're doing in a sort of a physical sense? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a very interesting one in terms of the season structure, particularly for the kind of strength and conditioning coaches and mapping out, you know, the block of hard training and, and, and trying to get peaking at the right time because it's so compact and there's so many games and probably in, in previous years, that gap between the National League and the more spread out season, you know, gave that they, there was a set kind of structure there in terms of strength and conditioning and, and, and when the, the blocks of training were coming. You know, you get a sense that um, certainly a lot of teams got a, you know, they all look in reasonably good shape fitness-wise and probably got a bit of work done. I certainly, you know, probably from a Dublin perspective, they got more work done before Christmas than they've probably ever done, uh, given the nature of the season. So I think it's it's very, going to be very interesting over the next few weeks because, you know, you kind of forget that we're only, what, six weeks from championship? Yep. You know, which is which is quite frightening. You feel like we're in the, feels like it's still, you know, early February and you, I, I don't know when your mental psychic, you still feel championship is, is, is months away, but it's not. So uh, I would say different teams have, have, have different plans and I think the next few games are very, very interesting in the league. And maybe after that, you might see, depending on where teams are at, uh, like certainly from a Mayo perspective, 
you got a sense off Kevin McStay that they were investing a lot of energy in the first four games. They felt they were very important in terms of even the opponents they had. You know, they've carried the gun, they've Tyrone. Um, and, and, and then, you know, I'm sure they're going to have to put aside uh, time for a block of training. It, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one because some teams, as we know, are going to run straight into championships. So uh, I know there's a break week in March. Uh, around the 11th of March so you know teams might be looking at that in terms of uh, upping the intensity and getting ready for, for, for the summer but it's a new challenge it's a new challenge for all the all the uh, conditioning coaches out there um, it, and it's a may, challenge for the managers as well yeah May, Mayo Kerry on Saturday night and Eamon and uh, Dara you were both obviously down in Castlebar for the first game and Dara you have had Kevin McStay sat next to you for many's the time over the last I don't know how many years what do you make of Mayo so far under him? Um, well look I didn't see the, the full game the last day of the Armagh match um, you know I, I thought the first day like you know, um, I enjoyed the game against Galway. Really thought it was a fantastic game. Mm. Um, and, you know, maybe, or could you say Mayo were fortunate to draw it? I don't know if there'd been another five minutes, but um, I was impressed with Galway that day. I suppose Mayo, like Kevin and his management team, they're still trying to put their squad together, you know? And and um, a, a bit like Colm O'Rourke and Mays, he's done a big sort of trawl of the county um, looking for looking for various players or trying to, you know, if there's anybody that they've missed along the way. Um, you know, every game for Kevin is a big game at the moment and and for that group. Um, and like, you know, I suppose you look at the battles that these two counties have had over the years. It doesn't matter if it's in the league, the championship in Tiddlywinks. They're, they're, uh, they're good games. They're really yeah. good battles. There's nothing left behind. It's all left out on the field. So, you know, look, it's, it's always going to be a work in progress for Kevin in, in year one. Um, and these games, like, you know, I know Eamon and myself were talking on the way to the, the match in Castlebar a few weeks ago about, you know, how how Kevin and the management team will actually approach this is, you know, is priority one to get the points on the board and stay in the division. Sure, they'd love to win it. Everybody wants to win a title. It doesn't matter what it is. But, you know, when they're trying to implement a new style, when he's incorporating new players into the wider group, like they're probably working off quite a big, playing squad at the moment they're getting fellas back from injury um you know and, and trying to unearth a hidden gem here there and everywhere so you know i i, I suppose it, it's that is very interesting to see what they're doing like look once the players go out in the field of course they want to win you know that's just the most natural instinct that there is but um you know we're, every week we see them play we're learning a little bit more and you know i suppose the first night when i saw them in the flesh i was impressed with the resilience very impressed with the resilience that they were able to to hang on and battle back and and eke out the draw and um, there were other parts of the performance that weren't so good um and you know you're going to get that on the first day with rustiness and shooting and all that sort of thing so um that was the big headline for me on on night one was the resilience having seen them in the flesh as i say i didn't see them uh, only the highlights of the second game, but uh, you can only go on what you, you witness over 70 odd minutes. It's a work in progress, but it was always going to be that. Are Kerry, I mean, they look like they're in good shape, Eamon. I think they'll they'll be looking forward to going to Castlebar on Saturday night, I think, will they? Oh, they will, sure. It's a great game and it's a great yeah. atmosphere up there. And the pitch now, since they've redeveloped the pitch, the pitch is excellent up there. Whereas in the past it was, you know, at this time of the year, it was a tough place to go to. Um, but yeah, no, Kerry, like, look, the league games, obviously, they're very important in their own right. Everyone will be looking to get points on the board. Kerry obviously beat Monaghan last time out, but they're playing Mayo away, Armagh at home, Tyrone away in this three game block. So they're all tough games. So any points you pick up along the, the way there is great. But I think also, as well, when you're coming up against the bigger teams that will be knocking around at the end of the championship, it's a chance to lay down a marker as well. And, uh, you know, I remember last year, Kerry beat Mayo in a in a really tough battle in Tralee. Um, I'd say you were on, Kieran, that, that night. Was it was that the, one of the wet nights you got caught in the studio in Tralee? <laughs> the, glorious, the glorious night on the side of the pitch, nearly. It um, was up in Killarney by the end of the match. Long yeah. Long. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was it was real tough battle and Kerry just grounded out at the wind and it was, uh, uh, they grounded out at the end, but it was a win that Jack actually referred back to a couple of times during the summer last, last summer that he felt it was a significant win just from the point of view of um, I, the courage and the resilience they showed at the end. So similarly, he won't want to be giving Kevin McSay any leg up 
uh, next Saturday evening or something that they can draw on later on in the year and they can say Kerry came up as All-Ireland champions and we we turned them over in our home patch and that was a night that we we you know that we started to really believe or become a force or whatever so the big threats you don't want to give them any encouragement and I think um, besides anything else Jack will be looking at that I think that's it's a very valid point Roy in that you know, even you go back, I think Jim Gavin's nearly on record saying, you know, when Dublin were very competitive in the leagues and were winning leagues and, and they had great depth and they were still able to try the players, they always would have targeted two or three of the games, of the key key games, whether, you know, it was carry the teams that were going to be knocking around at the end of the year and look at even their mail, their record against Mayo in the National League over the last 10 years. They That was definitely one game that they felt they had to go after and make sure they they, they kept them kept them at bay. So, I'd say Jack O'Connor sees Saturday night as the first possible real game. I, I you imagine the big guns will be rolled out, and it might be a combination of 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 of, of Clifford and O'Shea coming back, but he might still give the likes of Dara Roach and Donald Sullivan guys that have performed well in the last couple of games. That you know, like it's going to be a very strong team, I would think, on Saturday night, uh, and has the potential to be a. A cracker of a game because Mayo, you know, they would have been very disappointed coming out of Armagh. Um, you feel, yeah, they will learn from it. They really will learn from it. They should have closed out the game, their game management. Now, in their defence, I think Armagh got three, in my view, three very soft frees in that last in that last five six minutes that kind of let them get back into it. But they still should have got the job done, and and so they would have done a lot of. Uh, dwelling on that in terms of like, they were probably lucky enough to get out of uh, the Galway game with a point the ball was handed back to them but last week they would have been uh, annoyed they didn't close out the game against Mayo so uh, listen I think it's going to be a cracking game sorry no it's definitely game of the weekend for me Oh good stuff and um, moving on to uh, Sunday's Division 1 game Stara like the Monaghan Donegal game and night like, everyone knows I love an old cl- sports cliche and in soccer they always reference games as six pointers and obviously we only play for two points so it can only be a four pointer is this a four pointer for for both teams in that whoever loses um is definitely you know sitting on that trap door well look wasn't wasn't that the narrative Rory before the league started that these were the two teams you know because I suppose you know uh, late enough with the management teams and stuff um, involved and, and sort of put, put in place um, you know so uh, that was the narrative at the start that these would be the two teams for many people that um, you know were favourites to go down and look knowing people in both counties they're the sort of things they love to read and hear uh, people like me say oh great we'll show your man what the hell does he know and they're more often than not co- completely correct um, but yeah, look, it's it's a huge game. I'd say you're going to see a pretty tight game because there is actually so much at stake, like match three and you're looking over your shoulder already. Uh, but that is, look, it's it's down to the quality that's in the division. Um, you know, so look, it, it is the, the, the relegation four-pointer to rob your phrase for sure. Um, but, you know, listen, th- those kind of narratives, those both of those teams will be like if they can get a win on the board uh, on the weekend. And of course, Donegal have their their, their win over Kerry, which, um, mm. you know, regardless of conditions and, and all the bits that happened that day, that's a huge scalp for them. Um, and that that will give them huge confidence going forward. Um, but look, you, you can only beat who's in front of you. And um, I, I think that's going to be quite a, a good tussle. It's actually, you know, because there is so much at stake, that'd be a good match to be at, actually. I think yeah. I'd enjoy that, you know. And worries around Paddy McBrearty. Uh, um, yeah. It, uh, there's, you know, talk of a quite a serious injury, though we don't know just yet. And injuries are becoming... I suppose I don't know whether they're becoming more of a feature, or is it just more? Is it more because there's a lot more high-profile players, whether it's Comb or or different players that are picking it up that were more conscious of it? But um, this is the kind of game that Monaghan usually win, though, isn't it? That for me, Rory, is it? Yeah, sorry, Eamon. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. They they do, but I was I was very underwhelmed by them against Kerry, to be honest. Um, you know, there was none of the traits that you'd associate with their ident- identity in terms of um, physicality, uh, being solid, being well set up, tactically being good, and uh, then getting their their key men, their key shooters on the ball to convert scores. They were just, they were wide open in the second half. They just seemed a bit rudderless, uh, which surprised me. And... Uh, 
you know, we were speaking earlier on about the, the couple of weeks break. That couple of weeks break will have been hugely important for them from the point of view of ironing out whatever was going on with their system because, you know, Paddy Clifford's goal, nobody put a hand in him, which was so unmanning like And, uh, you know, they are down big players. I mean, if Darren Hughes was playing, you can be sure he'd have been sitting back in that area and he would have certainly made contact with us with, with Paddy Clifford. He wouldn't have allowed him to go all the way in like he did. Um, so if they had a couple of the players back, like the likes of Darren and Kieran Hughes, I think Jack McCarron's hamstring injury apparently wasn't as serious that if they got the likes of him back, I'm not sure about how far away Conor McManus is. But, uh, you know, if they get a couple of those players back and they start their, out their, their structure, they will be hard to beat, of course. And it's it's kind of getting to the stage, especially a home game, they need to win it or they're really going to be, you know, staring into the abyss. And... Uh, they're playing um, Donegal this weekend. They're playing Roscommon next weekend. So there are two games that, as well as winning and getting the kind of points on the board, they can also possibly drag them maybe closer to themselves and make it into a bit of a dogfight at the bottom. Because uh, if they lose to Donegal, Donegal are on four and they're down there on their own on zero, which, is, which isn't ideal, obviously. Uh, the other two games then in Division 1... Roscommon and Armagh, we know, they have had a, quite a colourful history because they were two teams that were in Division 2 together, now they're in Division 1 together, and they ran into each other a couple of times in Championship. Mm -hmm. And um, Roscommon, I suppose, are the the unlikely farm team of Division 1, and they're coming up against another farm team. Is it, in some ways, the most colourful Division 1 fixture, and could we get a, yeah, possibly. a really um, good game in the height? Yeah, I'd say Will Gant won. I think they met in championship a couple of years ago. Was it in the qualifiers or at some stage? And was a brilliant game. It was one of the better games of the year. Uh, like to think about our miles wherever they go. You know, you're going to be entertained uh, because they're 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 a good team to watch. And uh, while they set up, if you if your build up is slow, they they'll be happy to drop men back and and frustrate you. But they're but they do they they're very good going forward. Um, and have some quality players. I think from a Roscommon perspective, the character they showed in 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 both games and winning both games, uh, and the impact from the players coming off the bench and the quality of forwards that they are like both both of these teams have quality forwards that can score. Um, and you know it's got to be a good place for Davy Bourke the last haven't got that like the, to come from behind. I think in both games and close them out narrowly. What that can do for a team is 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 worth you know that that's worth its weight gold really. Uh, so they're in a really good position. Uh, people would have tipped them at the start of the year to go down. Um, it it like it will be it will be a great game. I I, I still think Ross Common's ambitions will be you know safety and uh, stay in Division One and build towards the Connacht Championship. Um, Armagh on the other hand, you know, are looking probably to break into that top three, four layer, uh, you know, they're certainly a team that goes to the end. Uh, have they a bit of improvement to do defensively in midfield? I do. I think they could get stronger in those areas. Um, but yeah, that's going to be, that. you know, the Sunday afternoon that, that, that both those teams will certainly entertain us, no doubt about it. Uh, you, you got a sneaky suspicion our man might go up there and get something. If I'm being honest, uh, they just might have that little bit more firepower um, uh, and confidence. Um, they will have taken a lot from the Mayo game, uh, as I said, even though they were a little bit fortunate, maybe in some of the frees they got, but to come back from five points down, you know, in, in the six minutes of injury time to, 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 to uh, salvage a point was, was a good result for them. So they go up there full of confidence. One point for Galway in their mini Connacht Championship, which was their opening two games, uh, uh, away to Mayo, home to Roscommon. Um, are... Got to be under pressure this weekend, Dara. Would you think? Um, well, look, I suppose that the the old cliche, Porrick Joyce, will, will tell you that there's pressure on Galway every day. Um, mm. Like we saw them the first night, myself and Eamon, and 
you know, okay, first first evening out, um, and I was looking at them thinking, yeah, you know, they, they're in good shape. Comer was going well. Sean Kelly was great at fullback and making those runs forward and scoring the spectacular goal. And you're looking at them thinking, right, stick Shane Walsh into this now, and they're going to be right back where they were in 2022. Um, the, the, the injury to Damien Comer uh, like has, I suppose, cast a shadow over, over things over the last while. Not as bad as uh, no, first feared, exactly, I think, and, is it? That's the, the point I was just going to make. Sorry, um, there. Was not you're fine, Rory. Um, no, it was just that like the, the positive there, he may miss the rest of the league, but the positive is that it wasn't his ACL that he didn't do damage to his cruciate. But like he's he's a big leader for them. Um, you know, the the sort of inspiration himself and Walsh um up front. Yeah, there listen, there is pressure on Galway, but I think there always is. That's the sort of situation that Porrick Joyce loves. Um, but we'll see. I think you're you you know, they're gonna have to there's gonna have to be a reaction after what happened against Ross Common. Um, you know, and, and maybe because the, the injury to Comer happened so early that it just kind of affected everybody else and they're worried about, you know, these things do happen. Um, Tyrone, like I saw Tyrone against Ross Common, the game that Kieran was talking about, and I was massively impressed with Ross Common and their resilience and the way they hung in there. And, you know, they've been the ultimate yo-yo team. But Tyrone were, Tyrone were in, Tyrone looked in bother uh, that day. Now, again, I just kind of judged it on the 75 minutes I saw. Um, you know, so this is a big game. It is two teams that are under pressure. Um, mm. And, you know, it's uh, maybe it has draw written all over it. I don't, I'm not really sure. But, uh, you know, the, you, you're going to need a reaction from both teams. Mm. Well, it's interesting that the game is in tune, which is kind mm. of the spiritual home of Galway football. Yeah. And I think it was the scene a couple of years ago where Galway really kind of announced themselves. And I think they made ribbons of Tyrone on the same day. It might have been actually the same day that Cahill McShane suffered a very bad injury as well. So not exactly good memories for Tyrone heading there. Let's shift on to Division 2 because it is probably the most interesting division. And it's a there's a clatter of fixtures here this weekend. That each one has different types of intrigue attached to them. So we'll start on Saturday night in Owen Begg, Eamon. And I mean, Derry Mead. You you, you, you just don't know what you, 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 you just don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. He's going to start in Parky Cave, you know. He's, oh he's, no, he's we we'll start. <laughs> he's doing a special. He's doing an hour long special on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just don't know what's going to happen on Saturday night. I, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see Mead going up there. Uh, you know, scoring lots of goals. Obviously, they're. They have a few injuries and they've had their Sigerson issues. Derry, you know, with the um with the Glen lads now fully back and minus the distractions of what happened after the All Ireland Club. You know, it'd be quite the fixture now, that in terms of sorting out who's who in Division Two, would it? Uh, it'll be a great game. And like there's a couple of things that you'd be what I'd be watching out for anyway that I'd be interested in, I suppose. First of all, is that meat for their first couple of games? You know, they've gone with the kicking game. They've been very direct. They've been very open about it, that this this is the way we're going to do it. They won't be able to do that against Derry. They're not going to be able to kick the ball, rain ball in on top of a full forward line because you'll have 10 bodies underneath it, dealing with it from the Derry perspective. So, uh, you know, have have me... Are they long enough on the road with Colm O'Rourke that they're going to be able to have developed that bit of patience to mix with the kicking game. You know, obviously, if they can get a long kick out away, brilliant, move it forward as quick as you can. But when Derry are set at the back, um, you know, what's going to be their plan B? So I'll be interested in that. And the other thing that Meath have done very well so far is, you know, their goal threat, and they've been excellent at getting goals. And Derry don't give up too many goals. So um, I think that side of it is going to be very interesting. But, like, I mean for Colm O'Rourke in many ways and for me it's not that it's a, sh a shot to nothing but I mean they have four points in the board already they're in pretty good shape uh, if they win up there they're certainly looking up they're looking up straight away but even if they lose it's it's not the end of the world you know there's uh, um, all the games are tough but at the same time having those four early points is a, is a massive thing and uh yeah, Derry were only, you know, okay against Laos the last day out and they kind of pulled away at the end. So you'd be expecting a bit of a reaction from them as well because I imagine missing out narrowly in promotion last year annoyed them and they won't want to they won't want to get 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 unstuck in a in a home game, especially. So should be a great game. Yeah, uh and in Owen Begg, which is quite interesting. That game live on RT2. Five o'clock with half four coverage starting. So that's definitely one to look forward to. The other 
big standout game in Division Two. <laughs> I know. Drum roll. <laughs> Drum, roll. <laughs> Drum roll. The other big standout game in Division Two, I would genuinely argue, is in, in Ennis Dara. Yeah. You know, the like Kildare really need to get moving. Um, because you know, it's not been a good start. They some people may have felt that the first day out in Croke Park they left uh, some class of a result behind them against an underperforming Dublin and then they were you know beaten comfortably enough on their own patch last or two weeks ago in Newbridge going to Hennis isn't exactly uh, <laughs> the soft landing that uh, Glenn Ryan might have been hoping for though No and look here, here's another cliche you know it, it, no matter who you are whether it's hurling or football or Camogie or ladies football going to Ennis to play a Clare team on their home patch is yeah. uh, it's it's one of the toughest places in the country in any code to come out of with the result. And I suppose, look, you know, you're talking about Amy was saying about Mead with the with the four points on the board, and, and just to add, there's a real buzz back in Mead after the two games. Um, just from knowing a, and chatting to a few people around about, um, there, there's the buzz is back. But you know, the, okay, they've they've got the four points on the board. The, the, the opposite of that is is the situation that Kildare find themselves in, you know, and, and how quickly this can all change, how quickly it can uh, go against you when you're you're sort of behind the eight ball before you even start. So, you know, um, I would expect a big reaction from Kildare, um, whether or not that leads them to a point or two points against Clare. I I wouldn't be so sure as you probably gather I'm terrible at predictions and I'll, I'll sit on the fence all day no problem but mm. it's a genuinely hard game to call like what are the conditions going to be like exactly um, you know so like that's that's um, it's it's a huge one for Kildare in game three and you're talking earlier about Porrick Joyce been under pressure that there's pressure here uh, now you know in, in, in an ultra competitive division two like a nightmare of a division to try and get out of so you know, let's let's see what happens. Oh no! I think with Rory and, and, and the flip side of that, like it's a ma it's also a massive game for Clare. You know, like Clare have to Clare have to go. I think to Derry and they have to go to Dublin. You know, uh, they've they've a lot of tough games ahead of themselves. I think they might have Limerick in the last game at home. They've Cork, which is probably a handy one for them. They pick up two points there. But, <laughs> uh, but no, like it is like every the, the focus is really on Kildare because we have this expectation that Kildare should be pushing on. Mm. Uh, where Clare have been solid in that division under Colin Collins they're under pressure as well it's a big game for them they've two points in the bag they're looking to try and hold their position in order that they that 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 they get in Sam Maguire as well so it's like it's, it's a massive game from a player perspective um, moving on genuinely now to uh, the big the big the really big one we know in Parky Cueve on say, Sunday afternoon <laughs> quarter to four a big crowd expected I think there's a big crowd but probably mostly dubs and yeah. it should be a good atmosphere good occasion you should do this preview yourself Rory just yeah, yourself. <laughs> yeah. well I'll tell you, you, you've been talking them up for the last three weeks so well I think I think Cork have a, I'm going to say it here I think Cork have a chance here I think they do I think if they I, I Eamon mentioned before if they develop a little bit more variety in their game Stop trying to run it all the time because in Parky Cueve especially and especially against a really fit Dublin team that just simply won't work on a sustained level for 70 minutes. I think if there's a little bit more variety in their game I think Dublin are not pulling up any major trees themselves at the minute. They're very, very experimental. He He's still waiting for some of his big players to come back looking at their half-back line the last day Larkin O'Dell, Lee Gannon and Darren Newcomb, I think, was uh, the centre half back. And I mean, I'm just kind of saying, hmm, you know, like that's not exactly scary. That's not John Small. That's not James McCarthy. That's not, um, you know, McCaffrey. Jack, Jack, Jack McCaffrey, which will probably be the Dublin half back line come the business end. And I think Cork, if they have anything about them, will feel Dublin coming down here. We need to stick it to them. And I think they have a good chance, actually. Well, the talk, Rory, is James McCarthy, John Small, and Jack McCaffrey are all playing on Saturday. Oh, well, <laughs> well I mean, that's one joke. shoot that idea down there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rory, take this all out. Ron's yeah. coming out of retirement for it as well, Rory. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think, first of all, Rory, it should. Uh, it's an awful pity it wasn't, the game wasn't maybe on Saturday. I think yeah. It was on yeah. Saturday with maybe Cork playing balls on Friday night and stuff like that in the soccer. It would have been. Uh, 
It might have been a great uh, weekend. Yeah. A little bit of atmosphere around the place. The sun, Sunday afternoon on a quarter four might take away a bit from the, the crowd. But it, like, listen, I don't disagree with you. Dublin, um, not exactly kind of firing, I suppose. And there was, bit, there was plenty of dirty days in there against Kildare. And I think, you know, not having seen the Limerick game, can't really comment on it. But I know Desi Farrell commented on a period of 15, 20 minutes where they kind of just weren't at the level he would have expected them to be at. And um, they are experimental. And, and really, you know, from a Dublin perspective, you're looking and you're trying to hoping that a few of the new players will turn, build confidence and turn in a couple of big performances. You know, um, if you look at, um, you know, Kerry and the depth that they're now developing, you know, I still feel Dublin need to just um, bring through a few more players and and, and, and you're hoping, I, I, I think Desi Farr is right to a certain degree to give some of these guys an extended run uh, in the league to, to, to try and find two or three. Um, I would expect Cork and Kevin Walsh's, you know, imprint. I think he's been given a free run. Um, you would have thought now he's he's beginning to get a bit of time with them. They had the two week break. Um, they will set up with a solid defensive structure and make it difficult. Uh, and as he said, if there's one team that you can kick the ball against and move it quickly, it will be Dublin. They will give uh, Cork that opportunity. So mm. it'd be interesting to see if there's any. Um, I suppose blend in Cork's play and they and, and and they don't run the ball, but yeah, it's going to be it's it's an opportunity considering the the players that Dublin are possibly missing. It is an opportunity for Cork, but still a kind of tough game for them. Ah, oh, yeah, it will be tough. I mean, is there a concern? Do we think? I mean, like Dara, you're following the dub since you're young, and you've obviously we've all witnessed an incredible era of success. This is more of a sort of a philosophical question because we all know how you know split Dublin in two and all that when they were in their pomp and winning five and six in a row and league titles and Jim Gavin I mean was all that like I, so I sometimes wonder the achievements of that particular team are going to become more and more valued more value will attach to it as time goes on because a lot of people were trying to maybe tarnish the achievements to a certain degree on the on the by virtue of oh sure they have everything they've they've all the money they have all the population they have all this they have all of that but we're now starting to see Dublin and correct me if I'm wrong Wheelo struggle maybe a little bit to replace that kind of quality and is the team that actually achieved all of that success for five six years in a row or however many are they in time now I think maybe going to get the true credit that they actually deserve. You get plenty of credit in Kerry anyway, Rory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, genuinely, there was never, uh, certainly from my perspective anywhere, did the group I was involved with, there was never a kind of, um, you know, looking at excuses or anything like that. They were just brilliant. It, no, it was a perfect storm in mm. terms of the the standard of players that were there was there was incredible. They're they're irreplaceable, really, Rory. Like some of those fellas, the level that they had in their backroom team with regard to their S and C in their preparation was at top notch. And then Jim Gavin as well and his management team. They like they had all they had all the components together at the right time, and they certainly maximised it. And they kept coming back, which what for me was one of the most remarkable parts of them. They were brilliant. But to have the appetite to keep coming back year after year, with virtually when it came down to it, pretty much the same squad. Okay, they might bring in a couple of new guys, but there was a lot of the stalwarts that were there for a lot of those years. So um, they, they, yeah, they're appreciated might be the wrong word in Kerry, but they're certainly <laughs> that group was was very much respected, and uh, their achievements were very much respected, and maybe in time. But uh, yeah, I, I I don't know if there is that. Do, do you think there's a lack of respect, like for what they achieved? Or I, I no, I what I would think is that people try to take from their achievements to a certain degree by virtue of yeah. using, you know, there was stuff thrown at them. Or oh, they have all this money for sure. You know, like they've always, you see, they've always had these advantages, Dublin. 
there was a narrative that this was going to go on forever. Yeah, and that's the point I'm trying to make, I suppose, in a sort of a warbled fashion, apologies, is that that this narrative that it was going to go on forever, like the quality now that's coming through that Desi is trying to find, it's certainly nowhere near the level that Jim Gavin would have had. Is that fair, Wheelow? Yeah, I think that's like, and that's, I think that's the challenge, you know, and, and you know, when you did make that argument, it was, a, it was a combination of, of you know, a couple of different groups of players and you had the the Stephen Fluxons and the Paul Flynn's and the Bernard Brogan and, and, and really top quality players that were there in the early part of, of, you know, going back 10, 12 years and they combined with, uh, probably a, a really good minor team that Desi had himself that had, you know, the Jack McCaffrey's, the Kieran Kilkenny's. Okay, Fenton wasn't part of that. Uh, and I think... Carmel Costello, I think, was on that Carmel team. So. Yeah, like it, was, it was the merging of, of, of a lot of a lot of talented players at the time. And the narrative was that this pipeline was there and every year another Conor Callan was going to be produced or a Kieran Kenny or a Brian Fenton. And... and you know, what was probably ignored was, okay, Dublin, where we're ha having a lot of under-20 success, not as much at minor level. Um, and uh, you could see that it was, a, uh, people on the ground in Dublin could see that this was a, it was a unique period. Um, but I think the narrative was that this was just going to go on for forever. Uh, and I think you still look at Dublin and you say, as you say, if you have James McCarthy and you have John Small and you have Jack McCaffrey and you have Paul Mannion and, you know, these guys all to come back, Mick Fitzsimons all to come back into the fold. They'll still be very, very strong come the summer. And we saw that against Kerry last year. But you are also in a situation where, you know, you know, obviously Johnny Cooper's now moved on and James McCarthy's not going to be around forever. Right? There's Dean Rock, Mick Fitzsimons. There's a few more coming near to the end, the winters of their career. So it's usually important from Desi's perspective that he, he he's trying to bring players through. And it, it, it's it's... It's difficult. Like it's difficult for a young player to come into any intercounty team, and you need that kind of. Sometimes it can be that one performance that that can really give a player confidence that he's now arrived on that stage. Do you know what I mean? Um, and 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 that's that's what I'm kind of hoping for. You're looking at these new players, the players that he brought in that are getting a chance, getting a run out, and you're hoping that a couple of them will just take something from this league campaign that would that people would say, yeah, this guy is ready for championship and he can step in and, and replace one of these. But it's that it's gonna it's gonna take a bit of time. And um, the depth, I don't think the strong depth is not there at the moment. And you just look at the quality that's walked out the dressing room door in the last five or six years. It's you know it just takes time to replace that. That that's fact. You know your heart bleed from Eamon would it? I'm about to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, that was the, the, the yeah. other thing, Rory. Just like they they were within a point of getting into the All Ireland final last year. That's yeah. how close yeah. they were. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, they haven't won the All Ireland the last two years. They're going to be in the conversation again at the end of this of year could, and could win it. And you know, all all of the all of this stuff is irrelevant then again. Exactly. Uh, he's playing, he's now he's playing it down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, it's a lot, a lot of really good football to look forward to. We can't wait, and specifically this weekend, and we'll be looking and watching quarter four Saturday or Sunday. Sorry, can't wait for it. And uh, listen, I just want to say thanks to the lads. There's a lot of good sport on Saturday sport, Sunday sport. We'll be covering all the games. Um, G our Saturday GA live is in Owen Beg for Derry Meath Alliance League Sunday. will be on Sunday night. Dara, you're probably out on the road this weekend. Where are you heading? Doing a bit. Um, I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna do Galway, Tyrone, and I'm gonna do Mayo, Kerry. All right, so you're full on. Geez, you're gonna get a really good, good glimpse up close and personal. Listen, just want to thank Eamon, thank Dara, thank Kieran, and thank Raf for falling in on the production side of it as well and giving me a dig out today. And we'll see everybody on Monday morning for the review. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar!